Okay. Double beta decay. So everybody knows what beta decay is. That is what we need the neutrino for originally. Double beta decay is two beta decays. However, it is not one beta decay after the other beta decay. That's just two single beta decays. Double beta decay is a single process, a single amplitude. Yeah? This is important to understand because sometimes that's not made so clear. It's a single amplitude, yeah? A single Feynman diagram, if you want, yeah? This is not really a Feynman diagram. Uh, well, it is, in, in a way. There's, there's nothing drawn in between here, but this is one process. Double beta decay is a process that exists in nature. It was predicted by Gerbert Meyer, I don't know, 30s or 40s, and was first observed, I think, in the 50s. Uh, it's the rarest nuclear process, but it exists. What happens here is that beta decay is just a neutron with a W boson, and then you produce an electron and an antineutrino. So in the final state, if you count uh, baryon and, and lepton number, everything is fine. Uh, you get two lepton numbers plus one and one to uh, minus one, and so the final lepton number is zero. Remember that all the Majorana processes, as we said before, will violate lepton numbers. So this is just fine in the standard model. Um, to, to find which um, isotopes we can, we can uh, uh, look for this, we have to go to the semi-empirical mass formula, which is sometimes also called the white sicker williams approximation or whatever. You probably have heard had that in nuclear physics or the drop model. Yeah, most of you have had that somewhere. And um, you actually get a, a, a parabola here for the binding energy, yeah? That just comes from the, the z squared term as a function of z, yeah? And uh, uh, there is a, a difference between even, even, and odd, odd nuclei, which is often called the delta term, and so which is a, a, a matter of uh, the spin alignment, yeah? And um, so NN, PP, uh, 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 combinations. Um, so, in order to see uh, double beta decay, uh, you need to go for um, isotopes that don't undergo normal beta decay, because otherwise you have no chance to observe double beta decay because it will completely be uh, uh, overwhelmed and it of course has to be energetically uh, possible. So we are looking for um, isotopes where the uh, beta decay, so we go up and Z, is not allowed but the double beta decay is allowed. And that happens, so for example this guy here, this one can decay, this one can't, yeah, because the energy is higher but it can go from Z minus two to Z this way, okay? And this is allowed. And so what that means, it's on the lower uh, uh, curve where the, um, where the N and Z are even, even. So these are the even, even nuclei, yeah? Okie dokie. So this is, these are examples of measurements of two neutrino beta decay. What you do is you form an experiment, and this is NEMO3 actually, an experiment I've been on, uh, is an experiment where you just look for, you use these isotopes, you look for two electrons coming out, and uh, the, uh, you sum up the energy of these two electrons. And uh, they have to come from the same nucleus and from at the same time. And what you do is actually not such an easy measurement. You get, for example, here for 100 molybdenum, which is one of the candidates, 
uh, uh, one of the isotopes that does double beta decay. All this is this is a two neutrino double beta decay with a little bit of background. You can do this with tellurium, you get a little more background, and with other isotopes. The typical half-lives for this are 10 to the 20 years. That's a long time. So again, we have to get a feeling for orders of magnitude. And the one number one should always remember is 10 to the 10 years. 10 to the 10 years is the age of, of uh, the planet, yeah? Or the universe doesn't really matter, yeah? It's so, uh, the, the planet is 4 billion years old. So 10 to the 10 uh, 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 is, a, is a typical uh, number for the age of things that happen on. That's also why the half-life of natural radioactivity like uranium is of the order 10 to the 10 years. Because if it was much shorter, it would have been gone when it was produced when the Earth was formed. Yeah? So that's the simple reason why the half-life of the natural radioactive isotopes, at least the ones which are around for all that time, is of the order 10 to the 10 years. Yeah? Um, so this is about 10 orders of magnitude uh, more. Yeah? There's a very rare uh, process. We know the Q value of this process, and that's somewhere here, 2.5 MeV. Yeah? Uh, the Q value is always the energy released in a, in like in a nuclear process. And, uh, however, the total energy doesn't add up to that Q value. It's a distribution, and the reason is because we only measure the energy of the two electrons, the neutrinos escape. Yeah? So anything that is missing here, apart from resolution effects, is due to the neutrinos. And that's how these events look like uh, in the NEMO-3. This is a detector. Yeah, this is about half a meter or so. There, there's a tracking chamber here. These are just Geiger uh, wires in Geiger mode. We look at them here from the top. And then there's a scintillator calorimeter. And you see uh, two electrons coming out. And that is an event display that's from the other direction of a two neutrino double beta decay event. And that's where I wanted to end the lecture. That's why it says end of lecture today. Neutrinoless double beta decay is uh, similar, but the way it works is now if these are actually the same particles, yeah? So you always, and also remember that you always can, you know, an Feynman diagram a particle going in the one direction is equal to an antiparticle going in the other direction, yeah? So if these are the same particle, you can actually link this line and make it a single line, an internal particle that's exchanged. There's a slight problem, though. You still can't escape the helicity question. The spin has to be uh, right. And so you have to somehow go from left to right-handed, or you because that's just due to the beta decay. So you have to flip the spin. And the only way to flip the spin of a particle is when the particle has mass. We have all learned that in the, in, in the lectures. You know, if, if the, the way to picture this is if you if a particle has mass there's always a reference frame where you can go faster than that particle and the spin which is the momentum component which is projected in one direction turns around because you run faster and the only way to run faster than a particle is if it has mass yeah so a spin flip will always involve mass So in order for this process to be possible, Majorana neutrinos have to exist, and the mass uh, uh, neutrinos must have mass. Okay? And the rate of it will actually depend on the mass. How do I measure this? I now add up the energy of my electrons. And if the energy of the electron is 
the two electrons summed up is equal to the Q value of that process, I know there is no energy lost to the neutrinos. The half-life for this process is given by this equation. One over the half-life is proportional to the mass of the neutrino. What exactly that is, we'll come back. Squared, yeah? So that's because of that argument I've just given you. It's proportional to a factor g which is something like a phase space factor. Yeah? It gives you, it, it describes the kinematics of the process. And that can be, that depends on the nucleus, on the Q value, and uh, uh, that can be calculated with high precision. And then there is this here, that's what we call the nuclear matrix element. And the nuclear matrix element, that calculates, that includes all the nuclear physics, because unfortunately, we don't have free neutrons here. The neutrons are bound in a nucleus. And that has to be taken into account, and that's taken into account in this matrix element. And nuclear physicists have to calculate that. But once I observe that process, I can actually derive this mass. Furthermore, I will have observed lepton number violation, which of course is would be a great thing. So this is the phase space factor. I've said this before. And, oh yeah. And the only thing I added here is because sometimes you should think of neutrinos double beta decay. Actually what it is, it's leptonic matter creation. Yeah, it's very unique. There's no way in nature to do that otherwise because you create two electrons out of nowhere. Yeah? And here, so this is this matrix element, and this has to, you know, you have to calculate how the initial and final nuclear state transition, that's the initial nucleus, the final, uh, and that is very difficult to calculate. It has typically 30% uncertainties, yeah? It's the big uncertainty in this game. The larger the nuclei, the more complicated it is to calculate, especially if it's deformed. You know, you, it's a multi-body problem. It's really hard to, to do. Sometimes this is used as an argument, you know, uh, uh, that this is a problem in, 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 in neutrinos double beta decay searches. Honestly, if you see neutrinos double beta decay, this problem will be solved because experimentally this is would be unique evidence for, as we said, lepton number violation. There might still be a 30% uncertainty which leads to a neutrino mass, but, you know, it's a secondary problem. It's, however, a more pressing problem if you want to compare one experiment with the other. So, these are the matrix elements um, for different, so what the equation means, which I've shown you here, is that the relationship between half-life and neutrino mass for every nucleus, so this depends on the nucleus and this depends on the nucleus. That will be different for what kind of isotope I use. This plot shows you which isotopes actually undergo double beta decay and can be measured. And this goes from calcium 48 up to 115 neodymium. These are all even, even nuclei that fulfill the conditions which I've shown before. This is a logarithmic scale. And to make it more easy to understand, this gives you the half-life that corresponds to a neutrino mass of 50 milli electron volts. Yeah? And you see that makes actually, so this is an, uh, a big difference. So the different points here are different model calculations of the matrix element. So first, for individual nuclei, you see a spread of about 30% in these calculations. 
but also you see that it makes a difference what kind of nuclei you use. This is a good one. Germanium is actually not such a good one because for the same half-life uh, uh, you get a worse mass or for the same mass you have to measure, you have a bigger half-life, yeah? Longer half-life. So if I just go by this table, I would choose nuclei where, you know, the, uh, for that particular mass, I get the shortest uh, value. Uh, this is another, so if I choose my experiment, then that would be the thing to optimize. But there are other things to optimize. The thing I can optimize is also the Q value of the process, the energy of the decay. So this is the Q value, now plotted as a function of the mass number, but it's basically the same you see for the different elements here, which we saw before. And the Q value goes from 2 MeV to up to 4.5 for calcium. What Q value would I choose if I had freedom? Well, the higher the better, because natural radioactivity has a Q value which is in this area here, around 1 MeV. If I want to get rid of background, I will go to as high a Q value as possible, because I'll be above the natural radioactivity. So calcium sounds like a good bet from this point of view, yeah? Now there are other things to consider. So this is the Q value, but here you see the natural abundance. So what is this isotope's abundance in the elements as we find them? And this is as a plot, which is easier to understand, in percent. Now here calcium is a loser, yeah? Because it only has 0.187. Plenty of calcium around, but you know, you would have to enrich it well, there are two ways to deal with this. Either you put it in your detector as it is, and then you have to live with the fact that only uh, a few percent of your detector is actually what you want it to be, or you enrich it. Enrichment is a, is a complicated process, which, of course, you use in nuclear, uh, for example, for nuclear weapons, uh, but you can do that. You don't want to use an enrichment factory which enriches for nuclear weapons, uh, uh, for very practical reasons because, of course, you don't want background there. So if it has been enriching uranium, uh, it's probably not good to put in the same centrifuge or so the, the stuff you want to use for a low background experiment. Anyway, but there are different ways to enrich and you can do that. But, of course, the lower the natural abundance, the more complicated and time-consuming and expensive it is to produce the enriched isotope. Just to give you a scale why this is important, because we want to build experiments with hundreds of kilograms of isotope. Some of these isotopes enrich cost of the order 50,000 euros per, $50,000 per kilogram. So, you know, it's not like uh, cheap. So optimizing the source, you'll have to live in this triangle uh, of, you want a good matrix element, high natural abundance, and high Q value, you have to find a compromise. And that, of course, also has to be related to your detector technology. There are two types of detector technologies. Let's say, perhaps the first approach I could take, I just take different isotopes, I build a detector around them that measures the two electrons coming out. So this would be like source and detector are not equal, not identical. So you have a foil that's like the Nemo approach in the middle, a thin foil, and then the detectors which measure the, the tracks and the electrons coming out. That's very nice because you actually see the electrons. You can measure the topology, which is important because, for example, the underlying mechanism of, that produces zero neutrino beta decay uh, could be uh, uh, disentangled from that. But the disadvantage is you, you are limited in the amount of mass you can put in and it's probably also worse in efficiency and mass and energy resolution. The other option is you take an isotope which you can make an exp uh, a detector from directly. So germanium we saw isn't actually such a great isotope for other reasons, but you can build a semiconductor detector and you just measure from your germanium and you then um, 
see the decay uh, uh, in your detector. And that's, of course, very efficient if your detector and your source are identical. Some examples for these different technology. There is the Quore experiment in Italy, in Gran Sasso, and that uses a bolometer. The trick here is, of course, that the energies we want to measure are very, very low. And we also want to get rid of background. Similar detectors have been described before today. Uh, but what you have is basically a crystal of tellurium dioxide, where the tellurium is the double beta decay isotope. One advantage of tellurium, by the way, if we go back to the natural abundance, is that while it has other disadvantages, about a third of the natural tellurium is double beta decay uh, 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 possible. And so you don't have to enrich things. Or if you want, it's not, uh, it's not that complicated. And basically what you do, you, you have a thermistor, you, uh, a decay happens, energy is released, and you measure that temperature, yeah? Change the energy. You get very good resolution. That's one of those crystals they have is shown on the right. It's a very small signal you get, yeah, microvolts. That's the most recent uh, plot from Quora. So this is the energy. This is the Q value of the beta beta. That's where you would expect the signal. This is some other thing, some background. You see a very low background rate, yeah? And they even have a bit of a dip here. Lucky them, but it would probably go away. They set a half-life limit of 1.5 times 10 to the 25 years. It's a very, very long time. At the 90% confidence level, what do we mean with that? So often when you don't find anything, you set limits at some confidence level. That would be a lecture of its own. But as an aside, I just say a few words about statistics. If you have very little if you have low, low rates you can, and, and ideally no background, you can just use Poisson statistics to describe that. This is the easier, simplest case. Let's say, imagine a counting experiment where we only observe 0, 1, 2, 3 events, yeah? Like they do here. Now we just use Poisson's law. What's the probability that we observe a certain number of events? Uh, and this is just the Poisson distribution, or what's the probability that we observe less than uh, 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 and observed, and this is just the sum. You just write the Poisson distribution here, which you have seen before, and now you can go for the simplest example, our ideal example. If you don't want to discover something, you know, the ideal example, of course, is if we go and see something, and you say you observe zero events. Then we calculate the 95% confidence level by just calculating the probability that n is less or equal to 0, which means just 0 because it can't be less. You put that in, and what you get is that the corresponding number is 3. So if you have no background, or, or uh, uh, you have zero events, then the number of events you exclude is three at the 95% confidence level. What this confidence level really means, again, that's a lecture, yeah? In a frequentist interpretation, you can say, if you would do that experiment over and over again, in 95% uh, of the cases, uh, the, the, the median value is in this confidence level interval. That's a typical frequentist interpretation of a limit um, that, uh, no, I don't want to update to the new Java. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Okay, let's leave it there. Um, uh, by the way, one has to be a little bit careful. Something I said wasn't quite precise. Often with these statistics, how many events do I need 
to discover something if I have zero background expectation and no uncertainty on my background expectation? One. Most people don't realize that. You only need one event. Yeah? Uh, all this only comes in because, of course, we have uncertainties on backgrounds and stuff like that. Yeah? And that's why we set these limits. If you've seen one black swan, you know that black swans exist unless there's a background because white swans have been painted black. But um, the positron is a good example. When you see the positron discovery picture, if you've seen that in particle physics courses, there was, that's it, one, yeah? Uh, so sometimes there's confusion about that anyway. When we don't, the only reason I have this is because when we don't observe something, we usually set these confidence level intervals, and in, in particle physics, it's 90%. And now we have a problem because this Java update tries to block, it blocks my, oh gee. Oh God. Maybe if you use the remote, it will work. Um, let me yeah. take that out. Skip this version, remind me later. Are we back? No? Uh huh. Okay. So back to experiments. The next type of experiments is Gerda. Gerda uses germanium, which isn't actually such a great isotope, but it's beautiful because you can build these germanium detectors. What you do, you have the electrons which are emitted in the double beta decay, they ionize one of those germanium detectors and you look, uh, you apply a bias voltage, you look for a pulse. It's very important again here to get the background uh, low and so what you do, you surround it with, sh with shielding and a veto and you also, your copper is ideally really low background. So there's a, another version of this experiment in Homestake in, the, in, in Surf, where also Dune will be, uh, it's called Majorana, that's the American version. And they actually grow the copper down there because it is underground and you don't get cosmogenic uh, uh, um, background. And so this is very important. Background is the game here. They've just released new results. I took that from Neutrino 2018. So, um, uh, so currently they have like tens of kilograms of, of germanium and that is the energy range where they measure. And I know this is probably not so impressive if you haven't seen that before, but this amount of background is just unbelievable or non-background, the low level of background. Uh, they actually get one event here now. The half-life they set is of the order 10 to the 26 years. Very impressive. Why are these backgrounds such a problem? Well, one of the backgrounds is, as I said, that natural radioactivity. Yeah? So if you are um, uh, underground and you got rid of all, your, all these experiments underground, you got rid of your cosmic rays, uh, you still have uranium chain things, which often the worst one, which, the ones which contain radon. Because radon just is a gas and it goes everywhere. Yeah, and um, so what's the typical half-life of these things? Um, 10 to the 10 years. We want to s go for 10 to the 26 years. That's 16 orders of magnitude. Yeah, that's a huge difference. Um, so suppression of the background is very important and in different detectors you do that differently. You separate alpha and beta, right, pulse shape discrimination, you suppress, you keep everything clean in, a, in an anal way, you know. I've worked on a double beta K experiment, every little bit you, you put in the detector, you measure that it's clean and stuff like that. Uh, now this example was not chosen, it was in my talk always, and it's not chosen because we are where we are. 
So for the NEMO detector where I've been working on, uh, to, uh, so this corresponds with the previous banana example which we had. Uh, I haven't had a Brazil nut yet, um, but for our detector here, this is super NEMO where I'm on, so the total radon emanation into the tracker must be less than 1.5 millibecquerel. One single Brazil nut has four grams and 400 millibecquerel of radium decays. I think Brazil nuts are particularly bad. Uh, in, in to, they are healthy. Um, you know, in the uh, 100 years ago, or not even, uh, even even today, probably, there, is like, uh, there are places in, 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 in Europe, like Batgastein, where they have these uh, caverns where there is, because of a lot of uranium, you get a lot of ra uh, radioactivity. People went there uh, because they thought it's healthy. Yeah? Um, I think the same, uh, uh, the same applies with the Brazil nuts. Yeah? Every, if you, I don't know where they sell them here with little radioactivity stickers on them or so. Yeah? Um, okay. So this is a super Nemo uh, uh, exploded view. That's the experiment I talked about. It, it has source not equal detector. We're building this detector right now. Now you might say, uh, why do you do this? It's probably not so sensitive as the other. That's actually true. But it is, if you discover neutrinos double day beta decay, it, would, it has several advantages. You can change the isotope. That might be interesting because you want to measure different isotopes. And you want to measure the electrons because we don't know the underlying physics mechanism. And depending on the physics mechanism, the, the dis kinematic distributions of the electrons change. The other thing you can do with a source not equal detector is you can, uh, whereas experiments like Gerda or Kuore, they measure an energy line but nothing else. Such a detector can distinguish between alphas, gammas, betas, so it can suppress background. It has lower efficiency, but it can suppress background extremely well. And that is the name of the game, like with the dark matter experiments. And you have to play that game, either energy resolution or background, or ideally both. I flash a few other experiments. Kamla and Zen, which has currently the best limit. It, uh, uh, you heard about Kamla before yesterday, but now it's been... Uh, it's being reused. They put a nylon sack in there where they uh, put uh, xenon in there, which is a double beta decay uh, 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 thing. And of course, this is, um, this is a completely different approach now from Gerda or uh, uh, Kuore. Here you go for mass and you don't, you'll have background here. This is not so perfectly low background, but you just say, I don't care about that. I just go, I mean, I still have to do whatever I can, but I just go for mass, yeah? And uh, that's where I get the sensitivity from. You have a scintillator. So this is obvious here. This is the entire spectrum. Uh, this is where the double beta decay lies, I think somewhere here. Is it this one? Yeah. Yeah? And this is their spectrum. Lots, this is the two neutrino, yeah? And they sit on this huge shoulder. But they say, okay, fine, we live with that. Uh, we just compensate by, by mass. And they get very good limits, the same roughly as what we saw for Gerda, yeah? Then you have other approaches which are TPCs. Now, in a way, a TPC is a nice thing because it can, as we saw today with dark matter and other, uh, in, in other talks, uh, you can measure ionization and scintillation and you can use xenon in a TPC, which is a double beta decay isotope. So you can build these type of detectors. Again, there's a big R&D program going on in that area. And this is how their, their signal looks like. Again, this is the energy, and that's where the signal would be on top of the background. Their limits are a bit lower, but this is uh, also because they have less exposure. So there's a whole program worldwide to measure neutrinoless double beta decay and just show you as a matter of curiosity how those limits evolved since the 50s. Uh, you see the mass limit we have in, in milli electron volts and we are on that curve. Now if you extrapolate that to the inverted mass hierarchy region, we will probably be there like in 10 years.
To evaluate the experimental sensitivity, it's useful to use this equation, which just, so this is uh, the half-life sensitivity at 90% confidence level. This is just something which fixes units, yeah? And these are the factors you can optimize. Your half-life limit will be linear with the efficiency. The more you see, the more. Better. And linear with the acceptance. It will be inversely proportional to the atomic weight. Because the heavier the nucleus, you only have one double beta decay in a nucleus. And it will go, because of the statistics, with the square root, like all statistical measurements, it goes with the square root of the statistics. And the statistics, is, uh, the signal is um, just the mass you have times the, how long you measure. And inversely, this is the background, is your background count in your energy window. It's not your overall background count, but it's how much background you have in the energy resolution window you, you uh, you define. If your energy resolution is very good, you, you know, it's the then you have less background because less can come into this window. So it's the background per energy window times the size of that energy window, which is your resolution. In a background dominated experiment, you get this typical square root behavior, which is just statistics. However, if you are background three, and that's where we come back to what I said before, that doesn't apply anymore. Then your sensitivity goes linear. And that's why you want to be background free. That's the red curve. Just a word on comparing experiments. So, uh, this is what the experiments measure. But when we compare experiments and the future plots, we use some theory for these values. Yeah? So uh, uh, that's the problem. And, uh, and I've done a quantitative uh, paper actually on this once. You basically have to use the different matrix elements and so to, to link. So that's what experiments measure. That's what we want to get out, yeah? the neutrino mass. So a word about the PMNS matrix. This is the PMNS matrix as we know it. If neutrinos are Majorana particles, we have to add another four, so these are the three terms we know. Yeah? Uh, a fourth term which is on the diagonal, which has additional phases. Why are they not there when we look at oscillation experiments? Why do these phases play no role in the previous part of the, what we do? Anybody has a guess? They're all on the diagonal. Oscillations always measure the transformation of an E to a mu or a mu to a tau. Uh, and that's why these Majorana phases play no role. Yeah? So, um, however, I can finally re reveal what this mass actually is. So this goes back to what Andre and we discussed on the, one of the first days. Because this is a beta decay, but you know there is no mass of the electron neutrino, so it's a superposition of the mass eigenstates. So the mass we measure here, where this process is proportional to the square, is a sum of the weighted mass eigenstates with the corresponding PMNS matrix elements, and you have to actually take these phases into account, yeah? It might be dominated by, the, uh, by this term or so, but it is a linear combination, yeah? Is that okay? Because the mass of the neutrino is always the mass of the eigenstates, not the mass, mass, not the mass of the flavor. Yeah.
Now this equation it will depend on the hierarchy. We don't know which order M1, M2, and M3 have. So depending on the order 1, 2, 3, or 3, 1, 2, this term will look different, yeah? this equation. Because you put in different values for M1 and M2 yeah? and M3. Depends how they are ordered. Yeah? OK? If you don't agree, you have to say. Um, so this is what we measure or sensitive to. But it will depend on the ordering of the mass hierarchy whether M1 is the lightest or M3 is the lightest, yeah? And so that's how we get these plots, which you have seen before. On this axis is the beta-beta mass, which is now called MEE, but that's the same thing, yeah? And on the right side is the lightest neutrino mass. And the allowed values will depend on inverted or normal hierarchy. Because depending on that, you have to swap these terms. Yeah? Yeah? How do Majorana phases are computed? Uh, we don't know what they are. So you have to actually, you see the bands. That corresponds to the uncertainties in the parameters, including the Majorana phases, because we don't know what they are. Um, I think inner, uh, inner and outer band, one of them is the uncertainty on the mixing parameters, the other one is the Majorana phases. Now, this just to give you a scale, this is, so this is uh, uh, in e, EV, so this is one electron volt, this is uh, 100 electron volt, this is uh, 10, so 100 milli electron volt, this is 10 milli electron volt, yeah? This value here is disfavored by cosmology, so this is what we get. Mm -hmm. Depending on the mass hierarchy, yeah? We sometimes, and that's why some people aren't happy with uh, uh, hierarchy, because there's another region where, which is what we call the degenerate region, that's where all the masses are approximately the same, which would be up here. Yeah? They are relatively heavy. Call that the degenerate region. So the inner one is the uncertainties in the neutrino oscillation parameter, and here you see the uncertainties in the Majorana phases. Yeah? If the mass hierarchy is inverted, there is no, there is an absolute lower limit on the effective Majorana neutrino mass in the inverted case, yeah? Uh, which would be this one. So it has to be in that band. Now, yesterday I told you that most experiments point to the normal hierarchy. So that makes it interesting. Different options. If it's degenerate, we are still okay. If it's really normal hierarchy in this region, and by the way, just go away and, and plot this. You'll, the make this plot is actually not that difficult, yeah? You just take this is just a simple plotting routine, yeah? Um, the, um, yeah. Now let's assume the normal hierarchy is true. And it's down there. The current sensitivity of experiments is in this region. Then we have a problem with double beta decay. But there might also be the situation for example, the normal hierarchy is true, and we see neutrinoless double beta decay. That would be weird. That would be really exciting, but also weird, yeah? Of course, if 
oscillation experiments tell us the Nyarak is inverted and we rule it out, yeah, so if that, which is not the unlikely, it's an unlikely scenario right now. So if we say it's inverted and we rule it out, then we know that neutrinos are Dirac, yeah? If the experiments would say that's the right place to look, the oscillation experiments, and we don't see it, then we know they are Dirac particles. So this is the current measurements which we have. They go from Gerda, Exocamlan, they go about to the upper end of the neutrino, uh, of the inverted hierarchy. Uh, this is most experiments currently being built just touch this. And in order to, to really cover the total uh, band here, you have to go to one ton scales. Why is this so complicated? Because you get hit twice. One over T half goes like the square root of the mass. So you get a square root between the mass and the half-life that kills you, that gives you one square root. And then statistics gives you another square root, yeah? So uh, to get the same limit, you basically have to increase your sen sensitivity by a factor of four, yeah? Uh, sorry, not the same, to, to increase, to, to get twice better, God, I'm confused now, to get a twice better limit, you have to increase by two squared squared, yeah? Which is 16 or so, yeah? So a factor of eight. Did I get this right? I think so. Um, so if the neutrino mass hierarchy is normal, then uh, it, uh, we, are, we have a problem. One ton experiments is just one example, is legend. Legend is an attempt to merge Gerda and Majorana the American and the European project, and build a one-ton experiment together. Ideally, if they are background-free, they would be on that linear curve, which at least kills one of your square roots, yeah? Ah, where were the sterile neutrinos again? I promise the sterile neutrinos come back at some point, yeah? If we have a fourth mass eigenstate, this equation actually has to be modified. It's now the sum over all four states. The mixing angle into the fourth states times some other uh, uh, phase. What we've done here is actually uh, uh, just use the current limits on the double beta decay mass, use the world averages for all these values, and then derive a limit on that, and we actually get a limit for M4 as a function of this, of this parameter, UE4, which is that parameter. And this is the sterile neutrino from mini Boon, and that's the range of values uh, depending on assumptions which we can exclude. So we just touch this region. Anything above is excluded. But the reason, even if you forget the plot, the reason you can do this is because if there's a sterile neutrino, it would actually participate in that decay, yeah? So when you measure its rate or set a limit, you automatically set a limit on, on sterile neutrinos. Sir, can you explain that plot again? Which side is excluded? This side is excluded. Uh, these curves correspond uh, to different model assumptions. It's not a very nice plot, yeah? Uh, so this is the most conservative, this is the most favorable case. Different matrix elements. So basically, in the most favorable case, we just about exclude this point, which is the mini boom point. This is with slightly outdated data. I think the, really the point I wanted to make, you get this sensitivity also through that. And that's how this plot is made, yeah? Yeah? It mixes in. It's the mixing. Uh, well, I don't have. Uh, so the proportion. So here it is. Um, how much it contributes depends on the mixing with the other neutrinos. So if the neutrino, if this doesn't mix at all, then it doesn't contribute. Sterile neutrinos contribute to 
are only visible if they contribute through mixing. They don't interact, but they still mix. If they don't mix, which would mean that value is zero, then we don't see anything. So they don't participate in the decay. They, not in the decay, only through the mixing, yeah? Through the mixing. So, in other words, the neutrino which we see, there is a linear superposition of all these, yeah? Decay, uh, of all these states, yeah? And uh, that includes the sterile neutrino. Okay, um, how are we doing with time? Not so good. Direct neutrino mass is the last thing I'll talk about, yeah? So, uh, direct neutrino mass. You can, we have double beta decay, uh, uh, just to uh, set a uh, scale, is about 100 milli electron volts or so, we can exclude with that. And, um, Another way to get a neutrino mass limit is from a supernova. So this is the one I showed on the first day. These are 1987, uh, 23 or 24 events. They arrived at slightly different times. If neutrinos had mass, uh, this would lead actually to dispersion of the signal. And you can actually set a limit on the neutrino mass from that, and that's 11 electron volt. At the time, that wasn't so bad. Today, it's not something you would write home about, yeah? As I told you before about sterile neutrinos, we can also get limits from cosmologies in exactly the same way through Planck measurements as I've shown you before for the sterile neutrino. And this is their probability density for different sums of the neutrino masses. So this gives like 0.25 electron volts, yeah? And actually in the double beta decay plots I showed you, that is this region, which is, because this is the sum of the neutrino masses, this cuts off this region, yeah? So it's roughly less than uh, uh, 0.25. But of course we can also try to measure the neutrino mass directly in, in beta decay. And that goes back to something which Enrico Fermi already proposes in a paper, which as you can tell here, actually wrote it in German, yeah? Mu groß, mu klein, mu null. Because this was in Zeitschrift for Physik. Um, and uh, you just look at the end point of beta decay, which changes if you have, a, let's say, zero to one EV. This energy uh, difference here gives you that mass. Again, the neutrino mass you measure here is not the electron neutrino mass. It's a superposition, like for the beta-beta mass. It's just a different combination, linear combination of the, uh, uh, of the masses, yeah? So it's again not direct, that's what you have to keep in, in mind. Um, people have done this, they do it with tritium because tritium is about as close as you can get to a, a simple, you know, low nucleon, number of nucleon system. And the measurement is of course extremely difficult because any resolution effect will destroy your measurement. Particularly what has often happened, if you have a resolution, what does a resolution do on a falling curve? If you have a falling curve and you apply a resolution, it only will shift the curve, it will flatten it out, yeah? Because more entries are pushed to higher values than to lower values, yeah? That's, you, you have a resolution curve, it will always make your distribution flatter. If you do that, that actually your resolution will overshoot and you'll get a negative mass or like uh, tachyons, yeah? And that's actually what a lot of these experiments came up with at the beginning and that was just a resolution effect, yeah? Because you would overshoot the curve, so, yeah? The way you do this with the current experiments is this. You take your uh, tritium, you have electrons emitted, you apply a retarding electric field and a detector, and then you tune that field in such a way that you just get it, uh, 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 only the, the ones at the end point go past, yeah? 
That sounds simple in, 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 in this way. It's much more complicated in reality because you have to get this enormous resolution. That's done by the Katrin experiment in Karlsruhe in, in Germany. What you basically do, you have a beta decay and then I will not discuss this but, uh, in detail. You go through a spectrometer and you apply this retarding potential and then you apply different values and either they go through or they don't go through. Yeah? So there's either zero transmission or there is and that width here, which that, that's basically given by the precision of this retarding potential, that gives you uh, then the resolution of your detector. I think I have said most of this, but uh, there is still some nuclear physics involved because you have to understand the tritium. Even though tritium is a simple model, you still have nuclear physics, which, you know, it's not at rest, that tritium. So any wiggling of that tritium will actually contribute to your resolution, yeah? You have to work at really low temperatures and low pressures. They produce, they, their throughput is about 40 grams of tritium per day. So this is the spectrometer and it has to be large because the size of the spectrometer uh, uh, is directly related to the, the resolution. Um, and they want to reach a one electron volt resolution. And it was built. Ah, I didn't fix this. I stole this from somebody else and I got it wrong. Because uh, the spectrometer is produced here, which is particularly uh, uh, embarrassing because that's where I was born in Munich, okay? It's actually here. So it was produced here in Munich and the experiment is here in Karlsruhe, okay, um, in Germany. But the problem was how to get this big thing from one to the other place, and that's not always the issue. So it went from Munich down the Danube, the Danube, the Danube, there, one of the longest rivers in Europe, across the Black Sea, uh, 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 Istanbul, through the Mediterranean, through the Strait of Gibraltar, up there to Rotterdam, and then down on the Rhine. The reason for this is because the dividing line, how do you call that in English, between the rivers is actually here. All, everything that goes in the Danube is in that direction. Everything that flows in the Rhine is on that direction, yeah? And that's the reason. So this is how it was shipped to Karlsruhe. And I think it was built in such a way that they didn't have to take down these houses. So yeah, um, they have started measuring um, and the experiment has just turned on. I think the important thing, you'll hear more about this in the next few years, is the ultimate sensitivity for this is about 200 milli electron volts. Just to give you scale comparison for neutrinos double beta decay, which I talked about before, that's a similar value, yeah? What we currently have in these. It is, of course, possible that these ex this experiment sees a positive signal and the neutrinos double beta decay experiments don't see a positive experiment. And that would just mean it's a Dirac particle because this happens when the neutrino is a Dirac particle. Neutrinos double beta decay will only happen if it's a Majorana particle, yeah? It might just be that the electrons are lighter, which, uh, sorry, the neutrinos are lighter, which is a possibility. What do we do then? Build an even bigger spectrometer? No, this technology has reached a limit. There are other technologies, for example, using holmium, and I have no time to talk about that, which will go beyond that, but they use completely different approaches. So that brings me to the end, just on time. Uh, I hope you find neutrino physics, and I would like to thank everyone for listening. I uh, hope you find neutrino physics as interesting and fascinating as I do.
If you didn't do that two days ago, now you should. Please don't hesitate to send me any questions to that email. Perhaps say I was at the summer school when you do that, so I know it, where it's coming from. That is even more confusing. <laughs> oh my God, it's a winter school. I only go to winter schools with skiing. Uh, uh, where is the skiing? I was on the beach in Rio to, uh, on, on Sunday. Um, so, uh, completely threw me off here. This whole, as I said yesterday, the whole astronomy thing here, it's all com very confusing. Um, uh, and uh, the, the sun is actually in the north. Okay, this is just uh, really weird. Um, so, uh, the other thing that remains to be uh, said, I, uh, we had this uh, great talk by Ettore this morning about uh, TPCs, liquid argon and xenon TPCs, and uh, there is a, one of the technologies which are, is being developed for Dune uh, is this Arapuka technology, and some of you make an experiment. There's a really great technology, and a lot of great work is going on in, in Brazil. Uh, and this is an international collaboration which, uh, under the leadership of, of, of places here in Brazil, including Unicamp and, and other universities in Colombia, Paraguay, Mexico, UK, Italy, and France, and the United States, to build a photon detector for, for Dune. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to participate in world-leading science and uh, the, um, in, in Latin America there are many countries directly already involved in Dune and other countries will hopefully uh, 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 follow soon. There's also a program between the United Kingdom and Latin America which uh, is called Global Challenges Research Fund, which is, enables us to collaborate from the UK with Latin American countries. And this is, uh, uh, we hope to expand that in the future uh, to include the possibility for people to, to visit institutions in, in, on both sides of the, of the world and to collaborate directly and expand the collaboration uh, we already have. Um, there's also going to be uh, several, there are going to be several workshops in, in schools and whatever school, uh, whatever spring, fall, uh, summer or winter schools they are. Um, I'll not uh, fall into that trap again. Um, and uh, there will be at the end of this month, or actually, well, August is not quite there, there will be a, a School on Advanced Computing and Deep Learning. I told you at several examples how important deep learning is. It's kind of a pity that we don't emphasize this more in, in these uh, kind of workshops uh, and, and schools. Uh, in, uh, in Paraguay. And uh, there will also uh, be a workshop, uh, UK Latin America workshop in December at Unicamp following that uh, school. That is really a summer school then, yeah? It's a Christmas school. Can we agree to that, okay? Um, in, in Unicamp, which brings me finally to the end. Thanks uh, for listening. Okay, let's take just a couple of questions before we go to the coffee break. Either everything was very clear or very boring. <laughs> Hi. And just to be sure, so we only can measure the neutrino masses from supernova and from beta decays. There is no another way to measure with accelerators, for example. Uh, well, there are these methods I, I didn't talk about, you, you know, that. Uh, people think about with, um, in, in, but at the end, somehow you have to have the neutrino and you have to well, you need a, a, a well-defined 
uh, energy spectrum and uh, that has to involve beta decay in some form or the other. Um, you could, you can of course uh, do things like electron capture, yeah? And that's what this Holmium method implies. You, but that's in a way, it's, it's, it's turning the beta decay around. You have electron capture and then you can uh, perhaps um, measure things more precisely, but in some form you always have to involve, you know, you have to come up with some method which involves uh, uh, these processes, yeah? You got to have your neutrino from something, yeah? Last question. Okay, if you have more questions, his email is there, as you have seen. So uh, let's thank again a lot uh, for squeezing. <laughs>